Welcome back to UOA On Demand. I'm Dr. Gino Chiapetta, spine surgeon with University Orthopedic Associates. I'm joined with my two partners, Dr. Ravi Verma and Dr. Matthew McDonald. Today, we're gonna to discuss a topic which is newer technology in spine surgery. Our topic today is gonna to be on endoscopic spine surgery. So Dr. Verma, tell me about your thoughts on endoscopic spine surgery and what type of procedures they can be used for and your thoughts on how it's applied to the clinical practice. Endoscopic spine surgery is an emerging field uh, and is a newer, minimally invasive approach to treating some of the same problems that we treat uh, conventionally or traditionally nowadays. Most commonly, it's used in uh, disc herniation treatment, um, and it uh, can enable smaller incisions, less muscle uh, injury, and um, a quicker recovery. Um, I think in practice, uh, the endoscopic discectomy is very effective at treating something known as a foraminal disc herniation because it allows better visualization of the foramen where there may be a disc herniation uh, without much disruption to the surrounding soft tissues. However, you know, there are uh, applications of endoscopic uh, spine surgery that allows you to do um, all types of disc herniations, including stenosis work and even um, fusions. So there's definitely an emerging and growing role of endoscopic uh, spine surgery. And um, it's, a, it's an important uh, tool to have in your toolbox. Great, thank you for that, for that explanation. And Dr. McDonald, what are your thoughts on what type of surgeries you can do with endoscopic procedures? What type of um, benefits there are to this type of uh, surgery? So I think most, Commonly, this is a, a, a technology or a technique that, you know, we, we're trying to, to use and implement for patients requiring surgery for lumbar disc herniations. Um, you know, I will say that, you know, the, the traditional approach that we use to remove a disc herniation is still relatively less invasive. It's a, it's a small incision. Um, it enables us to open the spinal canal and get the disc herniation out. Um, but it is an incision. It's, it's a little bit traumatic to the muscles. Um, but there are ways, we're always looking for ways to do things that are less invasive and less traumatic to the soft tissues uh, that might facilitate an easier or a smoother recovery for patients. So you know, the idea behind these endoscopic discectomies, instead of doing them through small, a small incision uh, like we do, the, the incision is basically like minuscule. It's basically just, you know, large enough to insert a little camera in. So it's the incision is millimeters in size. Um, instead of having to kind of move the muscles off the spine, we go through the muscles. Um, so it, it, it really promotes a, a, a quicker, easier recovery and hopefully some less post-operative pain for patients. You know, there are some drawbacks. It might take a little longer to do the procedure. Um, not every single herniation can be addressed endoscopically. Um, but, but the idea here is to, to treat a problem in the least possible invasive a way to, to make the recovery easier for patients. Okay, great. And Dr. Verma, what exactly is endoscopic spine surgery? How is it, can you give us a good description of how it's done compared to traditional ways we treat these spinal conditions? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, basically, in a traditional approach, like Dr. McDonald was alluding to, you know, we make an incision and we use either, you know, magnification or microscopic uh, visualization so that we can make a very small incision and visualize the spine and disc herniations that may be affecting the nerve roots. And in this instance, an endoscopic spine surgery, you're making an incision that's small enough for a camera to fit into, um, and that will do the visualization for you. Um, and it allows you to do the same work, but with uh, less uh, damage or, or injury to the surrounding muscles and, uh, and tissues. Um, you know, a great analogy to that is something like what has happened in knee surgery. You know, in the, you know, many decades ago, even something like a meniscectomy was done with a big open um, incision, similar to almost like a total knee incision. 
But with the advent of these cameras, now the incisions are just for the size of the cameras and the working windows. And the same meniscectomy type of uh, procedure can be performed without as much injury or damage to the surrounding tissues. Um, so that's the hope for this type of emerging technology in the spine to see that uh, we can still uh, uh, perform the same type of procedure and get the same type of benefit and outcomes without creating as much um, risk or collateral injury. Okay. Are there, Dr. McDonald, are there any procedures that you feel or conditions you feel are not good candidates for endoscopic spine surgery? I think there are a number of things we have to consider. Um, the location of the herniation is one thing that we consider um, in terms of what part of your spine it's at. You know, if, it, if it's in some of the mid to upper lumbar levels, it might be more easily accessed than if it's in the lowest, the lowest lumbar level. Um, herniations out in the nerve tunnels, which are actually historically a herniation that's harder to treat surgically, are actually more easily accessible um, through the endoscopic uh, approach. Um, and then there are actually patient factors that we need to consider too. We take into account, you know, the you know, patient body habitus and body size, because that can impact, uh, you know, the, the, the approach that we think could be done in the safest way. Okay. So to summarize, it sounds like endoscopic spine surgery, endoscopic spine surgery is very similar, almost analogous to arthroscopic surgery, which you know, patients often ask us about, um, where we can do these procedures through a small incision, use of a camera, and using the camera gives us a great 360 visual field of the anatomy that we're attacking with you know, very good results and low complication rates and good recovery um, for the patients. So it sounds like a really good technology. Um, Dr. Verma, at this point, um, what, what types of, uh, procedures do you like to do endoscopically? Uh, my preference would be for disc herniations, um, as we alluded to, uh, central disc herniations, which are the more common types are amenable to this, um, as well as, uh, the less common, but more challenging foraminal disc herniations, which are out in the nerve tunnels, as Dr. McDonald mentioned. Um, there are restrictions and limitations in terms of the types of disc herniations and which would benefit most from this. Um, most of the time, as Dr. McDonald alluded to, it's uh, some of the higher lumbar uh, disc levels, but the lower lumbar disc levels uh, typically cannot be accessed due to the pelvis and other anatomy. Um, so that's really where I think the power of this is in, is in disc herniations, particularly in foraminal disc herniations. Um, but I think as the technology starts to mature and, and uh, starts to uh, become more readily available, you know, the hope is that we can start to do even, um, you know, some bony work like stenosis management or even um, maybe some uh, minimally invasive type fusions with this type of technology. Um, you know, I, I go back to my, uh, you know, analogy to meniscectomy and arthroscopy, just because meniscectomy can be treated with a small arthroscopic incision doesn't mean that cartilage transfers or ACL reconstructions don't require bigger incisions and more work around it. Similarly, in the spine, there's always going to be a role for non-endoscopic type uh, surgeries and treatments. So, you know, it's important to know all the different types of techniques but it's also important to not force square pegs into round holes and make everything into an endoscopic surgery because not everything is most amenably treated that way. Yeah, very true. I agree. You know, oftentimes you know, bigger problems sometimes require bigger solutions and not everything uh, can be done, you know, with one single tool. Um, Dr. McDonald, can you just touch on since this is a new type of technology, new type of procedure, how does one go about you know, getting to learn this? And how does your background as an orthopedic surgeon doing residency and arthroscopic surgery um, you know, help you with this type of procedure as opposed to like pain management doctors or neurosurgeons doing this type of procedure? Yeah, I, I, yeah that, that's a great question. And I'd say you know, most practicing spine surgeons um, didn't do much endoscopic spine surgery in their training because it's newer technology in, a, in an emerging field. Um, 
the first thing I'll, you know, I'll say is it is surgery and, you know, someone performing this procedure needs to have a good understanding of the anatomy, uh, someone familiar with what the anatomy looks like and, 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 you know, you, people, surgeons who are good minimally invasive surgeons were, are usually also, also good open surgeons because they really have the best understanding of, of spine anatomy and surgical anatomy. Um, one advantage uh, that we have as orthopedic surgeons who do spine surgery is that we have a fair amount of tra training in arthroscopic surgery. So the use of doing surgeries with a camera and small instruments, you know, through our orthopedic training, you know, we have experience using these kinds of scopes to treat shoulder pathology, to treat knee pathology. So the, the, the concept is not foreign to us. And a lot of the, the instruments that are used are things we've seen in other disciplines. It's applying it to the spine, uh, which has become, you know, relatively new. So, you know, a surgeon has a good understanding of the anatomy and who is, you know, technically familiar and adept with the use of these instruments is, is, is probably the most qualified to be doing this. Um, as it is an emergency technology, you know, surgeons are being trained in this technique um, kind of all throughout the country. Um, and, um, and as Dr. Verma was implying, I think as our comfort level with this sort of evolves over time, I think we'll probably be able to adapt this to, you know, other spinal problems going forward, not just the, the, the smaller, you know, disc herniation removal procedures. Great. You know, I agree because in, in, our, in our, our training as an orthopedic residency, we've, we've all done hundreds of arthroscopic procedures, you know, to, di to di varying body parts. So it's applying the same knowledge and skill set we have just a different body part that we're familiar with using shavers and, and other arthroscopic tools that we've done used many times before. Um, all three of us in University of Orthopedic Associates are all specially trained and certified for endoscopic training as well. So I would urge, you know, any patients, you know, suffering from, you know, back conditions, herniated discs, certainly can, you know, request to see one of us to discuss, you know, whether their condition is amenable to uh, endoscopic surgery or other techniques we may have, to discuss the uh, benefits um, so they can live pain-free. I'll also point out, you know, it requires special equipment and tools and, you know, probably not every center that does spine surgery has these equipment and tools available. Um, and this is, you know, technology that, you know, we have available at our, our surgical center here at University of Orthopedics. Well, I want to thank Dr. Verma and Dr. McDonald for taking time out to have a discussion about this excellent topic of endoscopic spine surgery. It's excellent new technology, which all three of our spine surgeons are trained on. And we'd encourage our patients to visit our website at uoanj.com to get further information. And if interested in making an appointment with one of our spine surgeons for further discussion, if they feel they have a lower back problem. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.